Well, thank you, Anne, first of all, for your generous introduction and also all the help that you've provided to make this possible and all the work that you do for our chapter. So it's quite wonderful. And also thank you, George and Alan and Joe and Jim and others who have helped make this possible. Um, so I'm really happy to have you here. It means a lot to me. This is my first public presentation about my memoir, which has just come out. Um, so I want to start with a little story. In fifth grade, I totally bombed my oral report on Abraham Lincoln in front of a large audience of teachers, parents, guests on the large school auditorium. I stood frozen, humiliated, and speechless. I have managed to avoid any real public speaking of substance since then. So this talk literally is my first public speaking of any substance. So this means a lot to me. And the prologue that Anne mentioned, I will read a little bit later on. That's not what's happening right now. So by age four, I had still not spoken a word. Finally, my severe to profound hearing loss was diagnosed and I got my first analog primitive hearing aid that was a large box aid clipped to my undershirt or fastened with straps around my chest. And I can't tell you what difference that kind of hearing aid was from the digital hearing aids that people take so for granted today. It's very different. And although my friends know me as articulate, and I am that, I also have a young inner child in me that feels she has no access to her words. And this comes from the first four years of my life when I didn't hear and speak at all. When I was a kid at about seven and my brother was five, we would get into fights as siblings do. And he was very articulate and he would run circles around me and argue with me and say things back to me. And I knew what I wanted to say to him but the, the words were literally not there. And the same with my mother, she would come down on me about something and I would want to defend myself and I couldn't speak. So this was a great source of frustration for me. And it took years, literally till about the end of high school until I had the speaking vocabulary of my peers and could more effectively express my thoughts and feelings. So now finding the words to talk with you all about my memoir and my experiences of living with a severe hearing loss from birth is truly a corrective and healing process for me. And I may rely on my notes here. So this morning, I wanna talk with you about four things. First, what motivated me to write my memoir? Second, what was it like growing up with a severe hearing loss from birth? Third, how did I deal with the major obstacle of hearing loss for me? And then a at the end, a couple of takeaways for you. What does all this mean? So this will take roughly 20, 25 minutes, including a five minute read. And then I'll open it up for questions. So what motivated me to write my hearing of my memoir well, I was at an age where I was reflecting back on my life, I'm sure you all relate to this, about the different impacts that uh, my hearing loss has had on me. And it's had a profound impact on my life. But then more specifically, I had friends who had age-related hearing loss and were getting hearing aids for the first time. And they would come up to me and say, oh, now I know what it's like for you growing up with a hearing loss. And as sympathetic as I am to anybody dealing with hearing loss and hearing aids and all of that, I know they don't know the experience of having hearing loss from birth with technologies that were still very primitive. So what was it like growing up with a severe hearing loss? First, the, as I said, the first hearing aid I had was an analog one, and it really could not do what digital hearing aid today can do. And also the analog hearing aid I had could only accommodate one ear at a time. There was an electrical cord that was connected to a custom mold in my ear, and I would wear it for six weeks in one ear and then switch over to the other ear 
to help prevent the nerves from further atrophying. My parents chose to mainstream me in the Berkeley public school system. They were German immigrants. My father was a disturbed psychoanalyst and my mother was a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust. And they had their own stresses adjusting to life in America. And they simply didn't advocate for me as they could have and should have. And in the way that many parents today are much more proactive with their children. But it wasn't really until third grade that I realized that I was different. There was really so much that I simply couldn't understand. I couldn't socialize with other kids in the noisy cafeteria. And that's a time when children make friends and, and socialize. And I was, it was too much. I couldn't function in that situation. I couldn't understand the TV. The sound was just not clear enough, and I was really only on half power. And at that time, a lot of kids were watching cartoons and getting together as a neighborhood to watch cartoons. I would be part of that and couldn't understand anything because you cannot lip read cartoons. Neighborhood games and the rules of the games were tricky for me. My brother was very good at coming up and explaining what was going on, but if he wasn't there, I would often be lost in what's going on in the neighborhood game. I couldn't understand anything in the car with my parents in the front seat and me in the back. That was hopeless. Except again, if my brother was sitting next to me and looked directly at me, I could lip read. Oh, I should say that um, I... When I got my first hearing aid, I also had 10 years of speech therapy and lip reading training. And that came in very good stead because I am a very good lip reader and I rely on that a lot. Conversations around the dining room table was hopeless and classroom discussions were difficult. I could understand the teacher. I would sit in the front row. My mother would make sure about that. but. You know, so much of education is about back and forth class discussion, people raising their hand. And by the time I would find who was speaking, it would be too late because somebody else was speaking over here. So there was a level of socializing and education that I missed out on. So I'm now I'm gonna read the prologue, which all of you have in front of you. I hope that is helpful. This is from the beginning of my memoir, and I'm in, in sixth grade. I'm about 11 years old, and I'm training to run in an all-city track meet where different schools are competing with each other. And this, this is about five minutes. It was the day of the citywide elementary and middle school track meet, and I was elated that I had made the cut, one of only two students at our school. At age 11, I was a good athlete and very fast, and I was thrilled to have the chance to compete against other sixth and seventh graders from across Berkeley. I had trained hard for this day. For weeks after school, my teacher, a soccer coach, drilled my friend Mark and me hard on our school playground, yelling at us to sprint faster, faster, Day after day, I pushed harder and harder as I raced Mark, the only kid in our school who could ran, run faster than I, and I could feel myself getting better. I also depended on Mark to help me navigate the hearing world. Like my brother Elliot, Mark was very attuned to me. On the playground, he faced me directly and clearly repeated what had been said, carefully explaining where we were to line up, how far we would be running, and who had taken first, second, and third place. Now, standing in the center of the field, I surveyed the bustling scene, and to my surprise, I didn't see anyone I knew. Athletes wearing their school colors stretched out on the grass or jogged in place. Excited families settled into their seats in the bleachers, coaches with clipboards dashed here and there. My heart thumped in anticipation of the moment when I would launch from the starting line with the pack of runners, sprint neck to neck along other contestants, fiercely determined to beat me. And then finally, I would stretch into the finish to break the tape. 
That morning, I fastened my bulky hearing aid with an extra strap to ensure it wouldn't fall off from where it was clipped to my undershirt. I was ready. I was eager for my mother and father to see how fast I could run. And I looked all around, anxious to spot them in the crowd. <clears throat> Searching the glaring hot metal bleachers, I finally spotted them sitting across the field from each other. Their fraught divorce had left them with no desire to sit together, even to show united support from me. My father looked grim <clears throat> and formal in his wool suit, and he wore a handkerchief on his head, each corner tied with a knot, which cre created a kooky little hat to protect him from the sun. I watched him wipe sweat from his forehead and wondered why on earth would he wear a heavy suit on such a hot day. Far across the field from him sat my mother, looking cool and elegant despite the sweltering heat, fumbling for something in her purse. In the distance, I saw a coach yelling instructions into an orange megaphone as sprinters began to line up for races, but I couldn't understand a word he said. I had trained at my familiar elementary school playground, and I was totally unprepared for how the track meet would unfold in this unfamiliar place. I still didn't see anyone I recognized, and I began to panic. Was one of my events just now about to start? Where should I go? Mark, I thought. Mark will tell me what to do, where to go. Frantically, I whipped my head around looking for him, but he was nowhere to be found. Then, as kids started running, I stood, I stood for how the track meet would unfold in this unfamiliar place. I still didn't see anyone I recognized, and I began to panic. Was one of my events just now about to start? Where should I go? Well, let's see. My services. As kids started running, I stood frozen, a little statue in the middle of the field as races whirled around me. Coaches started about herding kids and lining up racers. Athletes whizzed by me as they took their places, ran their races, and whooped with joy when they won. But nobody asked. I needed help. No one seemed to notice that for almost an hour, I hadn't moved from where I stood rigid on the track. Finally, it was all over. As everyone streamed off the field, I saw my father in the distance, slinking away through the far exit. My mother was waiting for me by the bleachers, and as we slowly walked to the car, she looked concerned. Why didn't you run in any of the races, she asked. I burst into tears. I had no idea where to line up. I couldn't understand the man with the megaphone or what any of the kids were saying. My mother nodded and murmured sympathetically, but that was the end of the conversation. From the bleachers, both of my parents had sat and watched me just stand there. Why hadn't they run across the field, grabbed me, and guided me to an adult in charge? And why didn't at least one of them recognize I was in trouble and needed help? And now that the humiliating event was over, there was no exploration of what had happened, why I was so lost, and what might be done to spare such shame in the future. As my mother drove us home, I cried quietly in the seat next to her and gazed out at the window at the constant activity and clamor that made it so difficult for me to hear or understand people around me. A motorcycle roared in front of us. A bus reached to a halt to our left, and a truck beat insistently as it backed up on our right. Whenever I was amidst these kinds of city sounds, all I could hear was the tremendous clamor. And most of the time, interior spaces weren't much better. As I sat next to my mother, the rumble of our car made it virtually impossible to understand her unless she turned to face me, which she couldn't do while driving. Tears ran down my cheeks as I realized once again how terribly alone I was. Every day, I struggled to understand. There was so much I was missing. Meanwhile, almost nobody was listening. So shortly after this event, I went to middle school in a big Berkeley school. This was a big change. The first change for me was that I finally got 
the first behind the ear hearing aids that were powerful enough for me. And I finally got two hearing aids at a time, which made a huge difference in terms of both volume and also being able to locate the speaker in space a little bit better. <clears throat> at first, the noise was very intense and I had a really hard time walking down the school hallway with the lockers clanging and people washing dishes in the stainless steel sink. It was painful. But I did eventually get used to it. The brain does adapt. But the other change that happened at middle school is in elementary school, everyone knew I had a hearing loss. My mother had informed the teachers, and I had this obvious hearing aid on my shirt, and I had this electrical cord to my ear. So everyone knew. But just before middle school, I had my grades cut short, my hair is like it is now, and my hearing aids were hidden. And I then began a very, um, a strategy that was not helpful, which was to hide my hearing loss and to not tell people. Excuse me, can you move the paper from your face? On Zoom, the paper is in front of your face. Oh. When she's talking, she has the paper in front of her face so we can't see her lips. Thank you very much. So should I stand back a little bit? No, it's not. It's just the paper. Can you hold? Oh, I see the paper. Can you hold okay. the paper? There? Is that okay? Got it. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, but you know, then there's the problem, right? We all wear reading glasses. Can you see it? <laughs> I, I, I have to have it at the right, uh, right length, and the reading glasses are the. Uh, so then in middle school, the whole issue of understanding kids in the cafeteria continued. That was that was painful. The other thing, again, I couldn't uh, understand TV. And at that time, kids were walking around with transistor radios, listening to rock bands and lyrics. And that was a big source of discussion among teenagers. I couldn't participate in that kind of uh, what was going on in the culture and share with other kids. This was also the beginning of my phone phobia, which has lasted for decades. I could not hear on the phone. And occasionally it might come through, but often it didn't. And so I couldn't talk for hours on the phone like a lot of teenagers did. And I would have to rely on my mother to call my friend to make uh, an appointment to get together with a friend. Slumber parties, which is something that teenage girls do a lot of, was very painful. The lights would be turned out, girls were whispering and giggling, and I couldn't lip read in the dark. So I would hide my hearing aids under a book and pretend to go to sleep. In the classrooms, I was uh, at the mercy of where teachers assigned us. Sometimes I would be assigned in the front and I would do okay. Sometimes I would be assigned to the back of the room and my grade would suffer. And I really did not meet other people with hearing loss or who were deaf literally until my mid-30s. So I was very alone in this. And my parents didn't try to connect me up with other people. And again, that was a time when um, that just wasn't done. I was at a big Berkeley high school of 4,000 students. There must have been somebody with a hearing loss, um, but I just simply didn't know. And it would have been really nice to be able to share that experience with somebody. So yes, I did go through periods of periodic isolation and loneliness at different times in my life. And I would say this loneliness was the hardest part of my hearing loss, more than the um, you know, safety issues or frustrations of uh, understanding on the phone. It was more the disconnection from other people. People weren't mean, I wasn't bullied, I, people didn't make fun of me. I was just kind of ignored when they saw I couldn't participate. And my mother really wanted me to be as normal as possible. She was undergoing her own stresses and I just did not want to add to her trouble. So I kept my struggles at school to myself. At home things were fine, but the social life at school was something that she just didn't realize how difficult it was. In high school, the same issues continued as I listed before, but it was somewhat easier as I did make some good friends. And I also relied on two great loves, reading and playing the piano. 
I was a good big reader from age five or six. And that was a real window into the world in terms of understanding how the world worked and how people thought and felt. And I, you know, I continued to be a big reader. And then I learned the piano. My European parents had that as a value. And so I started lessons at age six. And by the time I was in high school, I was pretty good. And I would practice one or two hours a day doing that. But the reading was often a, an escape when I would be on the bus riding home from school and all the kids are yelling and you know making a lot of noise and the bus would come to a screeching halt and I would not be able to socialize with the kids on the bus. I would just open up my book and disappear and shut, the, shut that world out. So after high school, I had a wonderful year um, living abroad and, and studying. I worked on a kibbutz for a while, which was a very interesting time to be there in 1969. And I had my first love relationship. And this gave me a lot of confidence, which was good for me. Then I came back to Berkeley and attended UC Berkeley. And you might think that a large university like Berkeley would be difficult for somebody with a hearing loss. But ironically, it was actually easier because the classes were large lecture classes. So I would sit in the front, I could follow what the lecturer was saying, and there weren't all the class discussions that a small liberal arts college would have where there might be 15 people uh, having discussions, which I would not have been able to follow. I made good friends in college. Warm life had its challenges because there were three meals a day in noisy cafeterias. I would lip read, I would struggle, I would lean forward. Um, I did make friends, but I could not participate in sort of general group discussion. And then, of course, there were parties that were happening at college with the loud noise, um, and that, that was challenging. And I did tell people more and more that I have a hearing loss, and they would say to me, oh, now I understand what that is. I thought you were really stunned. <laughs> So after college, I married a son of a British Lord and we moved to London for three years. And I won't go into that here. It was a very difficult and painful time in my life. I was very isolated and alone. And again, I could not use the phone. The hearing, uh, the phone system in Europe is not compatible with our hearing aid, or at least at that time. So I would have to rely on him to make phone calls for me. But basically the marriage was a mistake. And after three years, I returned to Berkeley. And when I came back to Berkeley, I realized I need to support myself and find a, a profession where I can, can do that. So I got a master's in public policy at UC Berkeley. It was an excellent program, but very challenging. In order to get, um, this was in the pre-internet days and pre-emailing days. And in order to get information which one needed for one's papers and policy work, you had to use the phone and call all kinds of people to find out information. And I, again, I struggled with the phone. Um, the schools didn't have volume adapters. I talked to them about putting one in and it was too expensive and, you know, so on. And then also with, uh, some of my public policy jobs that I had afterwards. I had wonderful bosses and wonderful colleagues, but I didn't tell them about my hearing loss because I was afraid it would jeopardize my job, which at that time was a real possibility. This was still before the Americans with Disabilities Act that would require accommodation on the job. Then I met my current husband who's sitting right here wonderful man, and my life became much easier. At that time, he encouraged me to go into photography and painting, which is something that I always wanted to do, but I couldn't afford the graduate school program. And he thought going into the visual arts uh, it much more compatible with a hearing loss. So I worked for 15 years as a photographer, and then I got my MFA in 2001 in painting and I was picked up at that time by the Seeger Gray Gallery in Mill Valley, 
which has represented my paintings for the last 23 years. So I finally found a profession in the visual arts which is compatible with the hearing loss. So my memoir is also about my relationship with my parents, my complex relationship with my parents. My father was, was disturbed, as I said. I don't know if he himself suffered from serious depression, but he certainly made the people around him depressed. And he cast a kind of depressive pall over the household, which my brother and I would kind of offset with a lot of fun and creative dynamic play. But there was still a sort of an underlying ground of insecurity and lack of support. But he was also quite brilliant and a very colorful character. And I sprinkled a memoir with vignettes about our conversations that we had, uh, uh, amazing conversations that we had over the years between the two of us. And I also go into the story of my Jewish mother and my beloved Jewish grandmother uh, telling about their story of hiding in various ways in Munich as Jewish during World War II. And I mentioned my parents because in addition to my hearing loss, that has also shaped largely who I am today. They gave me a deep appreciation for the life of mind and culture, for music, for literature, art, and beauty. And for that, I am very grateful. So the third point, how did I overcome the obstacles of a severe hearing loss? And as I alluded earlier, the hardest part for me was the loneliness that I experienced at different times in my life, particularly when I was younger. Loneliness is a real thing. It certainly affects people with hearing loss, but it isn't unique to those with hearing loss. There is truly a loneliness epidemic in our country now, and our Surgeon General has written quite a bit about this. Loneliness cuts across all age groups from teenagers to the elderly. So I dealt with this primarily by being very proactive all my life in cultivating close one-on-one -on -one friendship. And I put a lot of effort into that, to making those kind of connections. I also joined small groups centered around things I was interested in, books, piano playing, art, and meditation. I was part of a women's group for the past 37 years that has been very supportive. Volunteering can be helpful. And I found a profession in the visual arts that worked with my hearing loss. And then I was lucky, I was also a very good lip reader, which helped me connect with others. But another important thing that made it possible for me to connect more easily with people are the profound changes in technology over the past 25 years. I can't stress enough the importance of these changes. And again, these changes are really of the last 25 years, the first 45, 50 years of my life, I, they were not available to me. So this was a big deal. So the most important of these changes for me was digital hearing aids. And I know you're all wearing digital hearing aids, so I don't need to go into that much. But the big deal for me was that it could be programmed for my particular frequency loss. And there were different programs that uh, could be set for different listening situations. Bluetooth connectivity to the iPhone was a total game changer for me. Finally, it was the end of my phone phobia. I can pretty much understand on the phone with Bluetooth. Closed captioning was also wonderful. Finally, I could understand TV and movies like everyone else. It's challenging going into movie theaters because they don't have captions and there are different devices. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So I tend to watch movies at home. Zoom and Skype is also great because I can use Bluetooth connectivity from the computer into my hearing aid and I can lip read. So between Bluetooth and lip reading, that works great. There's also assisted listening devices. I know you folks all know about that. I use it mainly for the television. And then also I will hang it around my husband's neck when we're in a restaurant um, to better understand what he's saying. It is by no means perfect, but it is better than not having that. And cochlear implants, 
has also been a huge thing for so many people. I know a number of you people have cochlear implants. I myself have not done that, but it's great to know that that is out there. And then there's the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the California Deaf Children's Bill of Rights. Both legislations require accommodation in the classroom and on the job. And gradually, this has helped promote and awareness and greater acceptance of people with disabilities. Despite all of this, I still have ongoing issues, which I know many of you face. Noisy restaurants continue to be very challenging. I'm left out of noisy group situations and classes where I can't follow the banter. Recently, I was in an art, a painting art class. There were 15 of us in the room, each one of us working away. The radio is blaring, people are talking back and forth while they're painting, and I'm totally left out of that level of sociability. Um, COVID mask, as I'm, I know you all know, it was a total nightmare. I can't lip read with COVID mask. Theater, I love theater, but I have to read the script ahead of time. I can't go spontaneously when a friend offers me a ticket tomorrow because I will not understand what's what's on the stage. And comedy and improv shows, you know, are, are totally out for the same reason. But I do have a deep gratitude for all the advances that have been made. It has made such a big difference in my life. And because of these advantages, advances and the close connections I have made over the years and my artwork. I have largely made peace with my hearing loss. So the final thing is, what are some of the takeaways for you? Loneliness caused by hearing loss is a real thing. So be proactive in dealing with loneliness by reaching out and making connections. And on the practical side, and again, I know I don't need to tell you this, but when I speak to the general audience, I will emphasize this. Get hearing aids if necessary and wear them all the time. I can't believe how many friends say they have hearing aids, they forget to put them on, they're in their pocket, they lose them. Um, they are not wearing them 16 hours a day, which is what you need to do in order to get used to them. Your brain then will eventually adapt. A new study published this year by the medical journal Lancet shows that US adults with hearing loss who regularly wear hearing aids have significantly less social isolation, depression, and even dementia. And that makes total sense to me. So finally, through my story, I hope you get an interesting inside glimpse into my life lived with a severe hearing loss, the impacts, the different impacts such as loneliness as it can have on a life, and how one can overcome significant hearing challenges. Hopefully my memoir will help create empathy, compassion, and understanding for those among us who face differences in disability, in abilities. And so I wanna open it up to questions of any sort. Um, and after, the, after we're done with the meeting altogether, I have some books here for sale. Those of you on Zoom can always go to, but you look so normal on Amazon or other places where you buy books and order books. Um, so yes, any any questions anybody has? Nice to see you. Hi. Thank you. Presentation. Really interesting for sure. I would love to read your secret to what happens with the hallmark. You know that's the I, and that's one of the sad things of sort of lack of communication, lack of communication with my mother, a lack of communication with my teacher didn't show up. Mark was simply not there. I don't know if he was sick or, and I didn't have the wherewithal to go up to him and ask him at school what happened. Um, yeah, and so it's like so many other mysteries with those with hearing loss when you don't quite know the whole picture. I have no idea. Thank you for that.
before you do identify yourself as you, right before you speak, say your name. Stand up and say your name. That's a very good question. It came from when I was in 12th grade and I was in an English class and we were studying Shakespeare. And my English teacher was from England, had a very thick accent. He mumbled and had a scraggly mustache over his mouth. And I couldn't understand the class. I couldn't understand anything he was saying. But what he wanted us to do at that time, he was playing LP records of famous Shakespeare plays of Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth. And he wanted the class to close their eyes and listen to the language. And, and I knew, I mean, I was totally lost. I couldn't understand a word that was said on the record. And so I plucked up my courage. And this was one of my first times actually coming out. I plucked up my courage and went up to him after class and said, you know, I'm hard of hearing and I need to follow the text. Is that possible? And he said, oh, but you look so normal. <laughs> and I got that from a lot of people over the years when I would tell them and they would say, oh, but you look normal. Um, and so I was sort of thinking, what would a person with a hearing loss look like? You know that, But it is, does speak to the fact that hearing loss is an invisible disability. And people um, aren't aware that somebody may have a real uh, hearing loss just by looking at us, because we do look normal. Yep. Jim, I identify myself. I'm Jim Schroeder. Yes, and I, I think even though people know, they don't uh, quite get the full range of, of situations where it applies. So one-on-one, -on -one, I'm fine. If I turn around and make a cup of tea and they complete, you know, continue talking to me, uh, I don't understand and I'll have to tell them. But even at large family gatherings, you know, um, they'll forget. And yeah, so... It, it is a constant reminder. People are very kind about it and get it. And I think it does help people to know, oh, that's what it is. Uh, you're not out of it. You're not slow. I mean, when I was in middle school, there was that uh, feeling of you're a little slow, you're a little retarded. Um, and, that, and that was painful. And at that time, I think there was a kind of stigma about hearing loss, which is not the case with uh, people wearing glasses or not, not as much. Um, and I think that stigma is less and less now as so many people are wearing hearing aids uh, and people are just used to that. Yeah, that's the, the, the analogy of glasses is, is uh, breaks down and this is actually speed. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Um, Alan Fitzgerald told me that we had a question on Zoom. And I hope I can hear that question. So can you tell us what the question is? I'm happy to talk to Zoom people. I'm oh, sorry. Jane. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. You have something to do to see Alan's reading the chat where the question is. Oh. 
Can you find it? Jane, do you have a question? Oh, so this, this is uh, Jane Nielsen. And I too was born with a hearing loss. Um, and it's not until I'm like 78 now. And I finally have, in recent years have gotten the courage to tell people I have a hearing loss and how they can help me. And I uh, just want to say that you producing your book is really inspiring that when other people begin to tell about their hearing loss and what can be done, it makes hearing loss more normal or at least more widespread and it helps all of us. So it's a, it's a thank you to you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me to hear. Um, it was a vulnerable process coming out because this is kind of like my big coming out and, and telling people what it was like and the, the difficulties of it. And I do hope that it has a kind of educational component so that people get a fuller understanding of what that kind of hearing loss, how that can impact a life. And you were very brave to not tell people for so long. That's, that's quite something. Yeah, well, there was a shame to it, mostly from other children. Yeah. Like playing the game past the secret. I was always the one that messed up the secret. Absolutely. I same thing. Totally, totally painful. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the climate today is very different. I have friends who have children with hearing loss and they are that these children are taught to advocate very assertively for themselves and to ask for help where they need to sit. Um, the classroom situations are much different. They have projectors on the desk where the teacher will write and it will be projected onto the screen in front of the classroom. There's note takers, there's uh, sign language interpreters, um, hopefully there's FM system that teachers will wear and the students can hear with their hearing aids. So it really is very different now. It, it's that kind of uh, coming out now that didn't exist in your day and in my day. Are there any more questions in Zoom? Oh, I just I have a question on here. Am I there? <laughs> I uh, where's the other microphone? And Susan, can you hear me? Yes. So can you ask your question? Well, it's actually just a comment. It, I think Berkeley at that time when you were young was one of uh, two cities that had uh, really great schools for the deaf and a very, seems more of a powerful deaf community. And it's just, I know you weren't totally deaf, but that your parents couldn't have taken advantage of something that they had to offer. Well, you know, that's a very big question. And it's kind of like the fork not taken. At, when I was little, there was the uh, School for the Deaf in Berkeley, which then moved to Fremont when I was in about fourth grade, which was further away. But my parents chose not to do that. So that was a decision that was made for me. And there's, you know, advantages of that and disadvantages. And the disadvantage is that I didn't have a community of other people with the same kind of hearing loss or deafness. I didn't learn ASL. So I am not part of the deaf culture at all. Um, and so I have landed more in the hearing world um, for, for better or worse. 
yes, but I, it was largely my parents who did not want to do that. And they certainly didn't want to send me to Fremont, which was a boarding school, and I would have been, um, you know, involved. And I did do reasonably well at school by working really, really hard. Um, so I did okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, my life would have been very different if I had gone to a school for the deaf. And of course, I have no idea if that would have been a better path or not. I think it was more the idea of the support you might have received from, um, you know, people in that community. Yes, I would have. I would have received more more support for sure. Um, and whether I would have been able to traverse that world and the hearing world, I you know, I just don't know. But yeah, I uh, there was more support available to deaf people at that time than um, people like me who were, who were lost. And, you know, one of the things my, my mother didn't do when I was in middle school is she should have gone to the school counselor and said she needs to sit in the front row in all of the eight classes and um, the word needs to get out and can she meet other people with hearing loss at the school and you know she was just too busy doing her her thing, and so that that didn't happen. But parent today would make that kind of um, advocacy. So I have a question. Okay. So I can't imagine what it was like for anybody to survive the Holocaust. It's beyond anything that I can imagine. Having lived through that thinking about the kinds of skills you would want your children to have because you have known what some of the most horrible things that ever happened to me that happened and they lived through it. Do you think that your mom was conscious of thinking, how could she make you more resilient? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, she had a little bit of, you know, you think you have it bad. Um, you didn't go through the Holocaust. That, so, um, I mean, she obviously had a lot of resiliency to do that, but she was sort of of the, you know, this was terrible, this happened, but you get over it and you move on. And so there wasn't the kind of level of empathy, strangely enough, that, uh, and there was a little bit of a lack of imagination on her part, and certainly on my father, who was out to lunch, to fully get the impact that this Kind of hearing loss would have. And my mother's uh, story is partly the fact that there were a lot of good German people that helped save them. And so she had a very close connection with some very close friends. And she wanted me to have that kind of social life where I would have, a, you know, a clubs and a drama club and the, you know, this and that. And she just didn't get that. I couldn't do that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So if nobody else has any more questions in the room, and does anybody have another question on Zoom? Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks.